All right, in this chapter, we're going to talk about phase transformations. When one phase switches to another phase, right? Now, there's a couple different types or flavors of phase transformations that we're going to cover. There's three types. The first one is diffusion dependent, but the composition doesn't change. So what would be an example of this? So the composition is not going to change, but atoms do have to move around. Well, this could be something like solidification, right? Solidification would fit this because the atoms start in a liquid form. They have to diffuse and move into some sort of arrangement, but the overall uh, arrangement doesn't change. Another example might be a change from one allotrope to another, right? So diamond turning into graphite, for example, would be an example of a diffusion-dependent transformation where there's no change in the composition. Now, a second type of phase transformation is diffusion-dependent, but there is a change in the composition. Now, we've seen lots of examples of this. Uh, for example, the eutectic reaction, right? In a eutectic reaction, you start with a liquid at one composition, and it splits into typically, well, two different, and it, spli and it splits into two solids at different compositions, right? So there has been a change in composition. Diffusion was present, okay? Now, the third type says that there's no diffusion present, but it forms a metastable phase. And we're going to give an example of this later on in this chapter when we talk about steel. There's a really important one. Now, regardless of which type of phase transformation we're talking about, they all include these components. You start out with a parent phase, and you're going to switch it to your new phase, and it doesn't happen instantaneously, right? This is not an instantaneous reaction. Instead, it starts out with a little nucleus, right? It starts out as a small particle. This nucleus can then either shrink and disappear, or it can grow, right? So nucleation and growth. And when it comes to nucleation and growth, there's two different categories. You can have homogeneous nucleation or heterogeneous nucleation. So what's the difference? Homogeneous nucleation is one that takes place uniformly throughout the bulk of the material, right? Now, in contrast, it can happen via heterogeneous nucleation. And in that scenario, it's going to happen at structural inhomogeneities in your material. These might be surfaces, insoluble particles, grain boundaries, or dislocations, right? So let's first talk about homogeneous nucleation. All right, what's the driving force? Why does something happen? Why is it going to transform from one phase to another? We know why. We talked about free energy already. It must be lowering the Gibbs free energy of the system. Or rather, the change in the Gibbs free energy, right, on a per atom basis, this change in Gibbs free energy must be going from a high energy to a low energy, right? And remember, in homogeneous nucleation, it's happening in the bulk of material. So let's assume that we start out with, let's say, 100% liquid, right? So we'll call this the beta phase. It's a liquid. In homogeneous nucleation, you're going to form a little particle in the center of that, right? This is an alpha particle, some sort of solid, as it's solidifying from a melt, okay? Now, what do we know about this? On a per-atom basis, what is the change in Gibbs-free energy? Well, the Gibbs-free energy of these atoms in the beta phase, if we subtract from that the Gibbs-free energy of those in the alpha phase, it has to be a negative number for this to be thermodynamically favorable. But we do this instead on a per volume basis. So we need to take the per atom basis and divide it by the molar volume, right? Because atoms can occupy different volumes. So if we take that change in the Gibbs free energy on a per atom basis, divide it by the molar volume, we now get this change in the Gibbs free energy on a volumetric basis. So the question is this. If the change in the Gibbs free energy on a volumetric basis is negative, right? So it's going down in energy to form this alpha particle. Why should there be any resistance, right? What possible reason could you have for there to be a resistance? Shouldn't this just be automatic? Um, doesn't a negative free energy always mean that it's going to be spontaneous? Well, not necessarily. And how come? Well, think about it. At the interface of this particle, all along the interface of that alpha and the beta phase, what do you have? You have a surface. And a surface has a surface energy. Right? We'll call that gamma. It has a surface energy gamma. All right? So, no, it's not necessarily true that it's always going to be spontaneous because surface energy is going to be a penalty. As you form that new phase, you have to worry about surface energy potentially uh, working in, con in contradiction to your uh, phase transformation. Therefore, this barrier uh, needs to be calculated. Let's calculate the overall change in the Gibbs free energy, right? Our overall change in the Gibbs free energy, take into account not only this component right here, the volumetric change in the Gibbs free energy, but let's also include this surface energy component. 
Now, in one case, since we're talking about changing the Gibbs free energy on a volumetric basis, we're going to need to conclude the volume of a sphere. And the volume of a sphere can be calculated as 4 thirds pi r cubed, where r is the radius of this, of this new particle that's forming this new nucleus, right? So it has some radius r. Meanwhile, the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi times r squared. So this is interesting. You have this competition where you've got two terms. This first term over here is negative, and the second term over there is positive. So if you have a negative term multiplied by something by r cubed, and a positive term multiplied by something to the r squared, and you plot those both as a function of r, how does that function look? Let's take a look at Wolfram Alpha and see. Well, you can see here I've plotted negative x cubed, so r cubed, plus a positive x squared, right? Gone going from 0 to 2, and I've left off all of our other coefficients, but still you can see that the general expression looks like this. The plot rises at first, and then it falls, right? So it's initially going to be a positive number, and then it's going to be a negative 1 in this expression, right? So that allows us to sketch this change in energy as a function of the radius curve. So here's our radius of the new solid particle that's forming from the liquid phase, right? That's the size of our nucleus. Here is our energy, right? The change in the Gibbs free energy. Our curve is going to look something like this. It's going to rise at first and then it's going to fall. What this means is that while you are forming your particle, there is a region, a size region over here where your particle at any given point, at any given snapshot, is lowering its energy by dissolving. But above the peak of this hill, right, and to the right of it, it will lower its free energy by growing. We can also identify a couple of key points on this plot. For one thing, we have this point right here. That is our critical radius size. We're going to call it R star. R star is the critical radii size below which the nucleus will just shrink down again and dissolve and above which it will continue to grow and it will become thermodynamically stable. All right? Now we can also identify this point over here at the top of that plot and we can call that our delta G star which is going to be a critical activation energy for nucleation. Right? If you can get over that activation energy then you will form a stable nuclei. Right? So what does this plot physically mean? We've already said it. Things smaller than all star, R star are going to shrink and redissolve. Those that are larger will grow, and we have an activation energy.